it's easier to commit. Yeah, exactly. And there's only yeah. around 20 slides, so it's pretty, um, you know, it's not super in depth. All right, we are live. So whenever you're ready. Cool. So welcome, guys. This is um, how to prep as a DP at DePaul University. So I guess this is just a collection of my experiences as like a former student. Um, and then we also have faculty member Dana Copper with us. Dana, if you want to introduce yourself. Uh, so I teach documentary and I teach cinematography and documentary cinematography. Um, I've taught uh, cinematography at Columbia College for like 25 years um, and then came over to DePaul about four or five years ago and I make my living as a documentary cinematographer. Awesome. Yeah, hopefully this this um, little presentation will give you a little bit of a bit of like information from the narrative side, but also documentary because those things are, I think a lot of the jobs that cinematographers at DePaul are kind of leaning toward. So let's get into it. So first off, um, when does prep occur? What is prep? So essentially the way I look at it is that prep is um, you're preparing for the shoot and it's any date before the start of principal photography. So during pre-production, um, it involves planning out all the logistics, but also like creative decisions that take place during the shoot. Um, a lot of narrative stuff specifically like I like to think that at least half of the movies you know made in prep because that's where a lot of bigger creative decisions happen which kind of enable you to have more creative freedom on set um yeah so that's prep and we're going to be going through a variety of things that you would do to prep for a narrative feature at least that's what I would do um and then also comparatively from Dana on the documentary side so let's get into it so I guess one of the biggest things that a DP is like mainly known for is building like a visual style slash look with the director, production designer, et cetera. So a lot of places where things start is obviously with the script or treatment. Um, so I kind of have an example or an excerpt of the script. Um, and I guess this is where like obviously all of the ideas kind of stem from. Um, so I guess Dana, one of the things I was curious about was how, what those kind of first conversations look like in prep for something like a documentary? Well, I have a saying, as I do, which is always set yourself up to win, right? So what you're thinking about in documentary or in fiction filmmaking is thinking of the pieces that you're going to need and the people you're going to need. And then, you know, really um, thinking through that and making sure those pieces are in place. In documentary, um, our first conversations, because it's a much smaller crew, it'll be me and this director, and we would be talking about the content, the ideas, and it's the same in fiction filmmaking, right? To be helping you understand what the bigger ideas are, um, and that can, um, I think my internet's unstable. I should be, I can hear okay. you actually. Okay, uh, and that's going to help you make a lot of creative decisions. Once you start to understand what the director is trying to say or what the bigger picture is, it's going to help you uh, make a plan. Gotcha. Yeah, I feel like a lot of students might, especially my freshman year, a lot of students were like really eager to just hop into production. And then my first set, we all hopped into production and it went terribly because we did no pre-production whatsoever. <laughs> So I hope this is something that people can take away and that like it gives you the ultimate freedom on set to be able to make creative decisions or make, you know, a really cool decision for something or the other for the story. Um, I would also say too that, uh, you know, you really have to think, actually it's counterintuitive, but you're going to start at the end. You're going to figure out where you want to end up, right? And then work your way back. So figuring out, is this a project that's going to just show on the web? Is this a project that's going to show in theaters? Is this a project? And that's going to help you technically and understand what kind of decisions you're going to make and really working through what your workflow is from beginning to end before you shoot, whether that entire and 
you know, a lot of people might shoot tests or something, a simple test where you take a camera, you shoot some different codecs, some different looks, you put them in the system. You know, a lot of people don't hire an editor till after the project's done, and that's a mistake. So find your editor, uh, get them involved in the process, work with them in terms of what your look is going to be, run through some different kind of ways and posts that it's going to happen so that when you're on set, you've made all those decisions about what codec you're shooting, what your look is going to look like, and you don't have to waste time on that. And then when you reach the end, because you've pre-planned all that, you're going to be much happier with your final result. Most definitely. And that's something I think we'll get into a little bit sooner too. And also like the collaborations that DP has with their colorist, um, which is obviously a very big component of like what DP did. Um, I guess moving right. on in terms of building yeah. a visual style slash look, um, one of the first pieces at least I personally kind of look towards is like creating a lookbook. Um, Usually I try to do that with at least the director and myself. Um, and if it's a narrative film, the production, production designer as well. Um, and it's interesting. I found that I really like sometimes doing the lookbook separately and then maybe coming back and reconvening maybe once a week or something, because then everyone's bringing like all of these different ideas in together. Um, and you know, when something's a really good idea, when like more than two people have the same exact idea or feeling. And that's like a really good feeling to have. Um, so that's kind of usually what I like to do. I usually create a lookbook for things like framing, color, depth of field for a certain scene. Um, so that's been really helpful. Some of the resources that I use personally are Shot Deck and Film Grab, mostly if we're pulling references from films or movies. Um, and Shot Deck is really nice. It's it might go to be paid someday because it's in like a beta. So use it while you guys can. Um, you should have the presentation and you should be able to click all the hyperlinks after this is over. Um, but Shot Deck is really helpful because you can actually create folders and you can build out a certain look per scene. Um, and it's created by Lawrence Schur, um, who's in the ASC. He shot things like Joker and The Hangover and stuff. Um, so I use those two quite a bit for film references. And then the Library of Congress is like another archival sort of thing that I've found that has a lot of photography online. Um, I also know a lot of directors who use films and clips because depending on the director, that preps a lot differently, you know. Um, they'll use clips for movies or GIFs. Like I remember when Miles and I for the ESC, we were interviewing Lark and Seipel, who shot like Swiss Army Man and things like that. Um, and he works a lot with Hiro Mirai, uh, uh, music videos and things like that, he was like the director of Atlanta, the TV show. And he was telling me that Hiro uses a lot of anime as references, which I found pretty interesting. You can kind of pull them from anywhere. I feel like a lot of people get stuck on having to come from film. Um, you can really pull them from anywhere. I know a lot of people are also really into pulling them from photography books, and things like that, or um, storyboarding. Um, Dana, is there anywhere you feel like you particularly pull references or get ideas? I know some people don't even really pull references. But I'm uh, I mean, I'll pull them from anywhere, you know, commercials, music videos, um, paintings, anywhere that you feel like inspire you and it's an inspiration process but it's also a communication process so it's communicating with not only your director but also your crew what you're going for and so instead of trying to describe it's an 80s look it's it's a little bit retro like those words can mean different things to different people but the minute you start putting up images it, it becomes a lot clearer to everybody definitely definitely and i feel like something that was said to me a while back was that just the phrase that words are messy um, and images are better. So I guess we're working in a visual medium. So what would be a better tool for that? Um, this steal, is like some... steal, steal. This is what I'm telling you. Steal, <laughs> steal, steal. I mean, inspire, inspire, inspire. <laughs> I have some examples of stealing in a sec. Um, <laughs> so I pulled some, like just some lookbook images that I used in a lookbook for a film I did. Um, so these were some images that I found on film grab and shot deck um, and things like that. And I usually like to put in a description um, 
And personally, I really like to talk with the director and the production designer and, you know, the other key department heads about like specifically why a certain thing is um, in the lookbook. Because I feel like some people can really get caught up in it and think that they have to find an image that's like perfectly for their look. But really, I mean, for this image on the left, the only reason I picked it was Frank. Um, not because of the color. I also like the depth of field. And this one is for framing as well. Um, so you can always pick images for specific things. And just I like to note them at the bottom um, so that it's very clear to people so they don't get the wrong idea. Um, this is another thing, you know, this is like a photo that I took. Um, this is like a completely different aspect ratio, but for this, it was kind of about vertical elements and headspace. Those were the two things I tried to center on. Um, I guess, Dana, I was curious, like, what kind of approach to prep in the creative sense is different for documentary, or if you feel like anything's different in terms of that, because it's mostly just you and the director. Um, for yeah, example. I mean, I think that what would surprise people is how much um, poetic stuff we actually shoot in documentary. I, th I think people sometimes think that documentary is just you show up with a camera and you shoot what's in front of you and it's you're just documenting something that's happening. And it it couldn't be further from the truth that we we usually end up shooting a lot of really artistic stuff in documentaries, whether that's space or shots in between scenes or mood pieces or um we might uh i don't know if you guys i can highly recommend a film called dick johnson is dead it's a movie about it's a documentary about a daughter saying goodbye to her dying father sounds terrible but it's actually really beautiful and she does all these crazy like on the stage slow motion like all this really artistic stuff and it has an emotional center to it um so you know, we're, we're always trying to think of ways in our documentaries to bring other visuals into it other than just an interview shot, which is important, or just people standing around talking, which is important. But when you start really looking at documentaries, you'll see all the other artistic stuff. So it's kind of figuring out where can we play, what kind of fun images can we put in, are fun, different, engaging, interesting, compelling images, and really thinking, thinking that through. And also, you know, um, yeah, I would say that that's a lot of our conversations. And then yeah. the main conversation is content. Whose story is it? Why are we telling it? And um, as the more I understand that, then I'm able to make decisions on the fly, which is really the key to documentaries. You're making decisions like this. Totally. And it's a really good movie. You guys should check it out. I think it's on Netflix. Um, it is on Netflix. Yeah. Dick Johnson um, is dead. Yeah. Yeah. And I was curious, I guess, I know you've worked a ton of different jobs over the years. Um, if like you found that prep changes from like a verite doc to something that's less in that vein, or you feel like it's kind of pretty straightforward and working with the director and kind of finding part of it. You know, I think that, you know, the more conversations you have and the more you plan stuff, the more secure you can be in those moments where things are out of control that you don't know what's happening. So, you know, the worst is to show up and not know anything about what's happening or why you're there. Uh, so it's even more important, I think, to really understand and have those conversations. So, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know how else to answer that. Yeah, definitely. Cool. So in terms of prep, at least for a narrative um, and for documentaries, um, usually you have a shot list, depending on the director. Some directors want it, some directors might not. But at the end of the day, I really like to do a shot list just because it's kind of a exercise for you working with the director in a certain sense before the project starts, seeing if you guys are compatible in terms of your visual sensibilities but also in terms of, you know, having a very small, like, backup plan um, in case everything hits the fan you need to go back to square one. At least you would have, you know, a shot list of the absolute necessities you need to get from the scene. Um, so usually I like to work off of that. The shot list that I use is just a modified version of Studio Binder shot list. It's just service that's they actually released this template for free. So if you guys download this presentation, you can click on this hyperlink to that. 
um, and I kind of modified it a bit for me, but it's really nice because you can kind of go in and change, you know, what shot size is, angle, movement, et cetera. Um, and one of the toughest things I feel like about a shot list, just because it's inherently just not a visual medium, is it's really important in the lookbook to decide things like, you know, a medium close up to you might be right here, but to a director, it might be right here. Um, which could lead to some problems and miscommunication on set just because everyone has a different language. Um, so I think ironing that stuff out in your lookbook is also pretty helpful usually when working with the first time director. Um, and I know, you know, one of the things I did recently, I was pretty adamant about having a shot list um, and the director is pretty adamant about not having one at all or even doing one. <laughs> and they like to really do things on the fly. It's pretty frustrating in some senses because I feel like personally for me, you know, I made one for myself um, and the director was really in bliss. But it's, I guess, also a bit of a reminder that, you know, every director preps differently. And then, you know, at the end of the day, our job is to serve the director's vision. So as long as they're happy at the end of the day, um, Dana, you had something to say. Yeah. And I would also say that it's important to make a shot list. I actually like, I don't, I looked through the presentation, I didn't see it, but I do overheads. Mm -hmm. So um, it would be where the characters are moving, where the camera positions are. And I uh, I like that because what I want to do is I want to be really efficient with my shooting. I don't want to have to, if you don't have a shot list, you're going to end up, you know, shooting in one direction, which you're going to set up in light. And then you turn around on a character and shoot that direction. And then if you don't plan well, then you're going to have to turn around again and relight that other angle and it's a time waster. And a lot of people think of movies and they think, well, I, yeah, I know I should make a money budget and that's super important, but even more important is your time budget because time does not, uh, it just, the, the day starts and then the clock just starts ripping and the, the day ends. And if you haven't gotten everything shot that you wanted to get shot, then you're done. But if you can figure out, okay, I can be efficient. I can, I look at my sheet, I look at my overheads, I can see I can shoot this angle, I can shoot this angle and then that angle, and I only have to light that once and then I can spin around. You're gonna get more shots, they're gonna be better and you're gonna make your day. Totally, yeah. I think it's always interesting, you know, when you're in the, like the back half of your day and you had all these ambitious things in your shot list and it's magically compressed into like three instead of nine. Um, <laughs> it's interesting how fast people will cut stuff, but it's always nice to have, I feel like, cause also in the rush of like working on set and the chaos of it, it's like the only thing that's dependable <laughs> that I feel like I have. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I always think of being on set, like being in the middle of a hurricane. <laughs> That's you know, where decisions are hard because everything you're just like overwhelmed with all the craziness, you know, and things that you would be simple otherwise are not simple all of a sudden. But um, I mean, I don't know if this is the time to talk about it, but one thing that I used to do in my classes was it was super helpful is have the, the, the actors there and the DP and the director and we would take a scene and that they would um, do like a rehearsal and then kind of rehearse the camera positions, right? And so, okay, I think this is the first shot. It, it, so it wasn't even necessarily in the location. It would be better if it was in the location, but it doesn't have to be. And just kind of walk through the angles of the scene and then just do a quick little edit of it. Just, it's like, a I call it a video storyboard. And I got to tell you, you know, it just, it's so helpful because once you start editing it together and in that kind of like low pressure situation where you don't have a crew hanging on you and you're worried about the light and all that stuff, the creativity starts to flow about how to do the visuals. And then when you're actually shooting the scene, you just are so much more prepared for what you're doing. Definitely. And it feels like having done something like that before, it's so freeing on set because you can realize, you can really be confident in what you really do need. Because a lot of times like in the rush of things, it's hard to like cut it all together in your head and be like, okay, we don't really need this and we can use this instead. Um, right. So or even really like, awesome. 
I've had stuff where people, you know, like that shot where someone turns around and sees somebody, right? And they're like, oh my gosh, it's that person in that crazy outfit. And and they did the shot and it started on the person's feet and then it went like tilted up on the subject, but the pacing was off in the, it was a comedy and they didn't see it until after they had shot the whole movie and they were like, oh no. And see if they had walked it through, they would have edited it together and they would have seen, oh, when that person looks and says, oh no, the camera should go whoop on the person, right? The pacing of that camera move, but you can't change it after it's done. Mm-hmm. Hey y'all. So we have a question from Instagram. Um, how do you decide what to cut? Kind of who is in the conversation on set when you're talking about cutting shots and how do you as a DP make your voice heard? Really okay, well, I have to tell you, the one thing as a DP to always remember is it's not your film. Mm-hmm. Right? You're only there to assist the director. And so... <laughs> Um, you can make your opinion and, but if the director says, we're not shooting that, that's, it's their film. You want to make a film, go make your own film. Don't fight your director if you can help it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've been in situations where I guess maybe working with a first time director or something, it's nice because they kind of lean on the DP more in some senses. Um, but for the most part, I would say, usually I kind of would look to the director to see what they would need. Um, because at the end of the day, all we're doing is shooting the pieces necessary for assembly. Um, we're not going to be the ones seeing it through the end. So, but, you know, most of the time, one of the things that I consider is like, will the scene cut? (laughs) (laughs) If the scene will not cut, I will not leave until the scene is cut. Um, and you know, if you have to shoot the whole thing at a wide, at least get that, um, I would say, but if there is like specific beats, that would be, you know, nice to have maybe a medium close up and a close up on someone. You kind of have to choose between one or the other to see what's really important. Um, and you have to so- be able to articulate that. Like, okay, so we can we can shoot this whole scene in a wide and a one take, but this is what I'm worried about. I'm worried you're not going to be able to control the pacing of it. So. I would feel better if we could get maybe some 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 two shots or some. Cl- you know, singles, you don't have to use them, but I'd feel better if you had them and we're here and we might as well shoot them. And if, and you've said it, and if they still vote you down, you, you tried, you know, that's all mm-hmm. you can do. Yeah. One of the instances I've been in with like a really tight schedule and just doing a wide is I've also done things like cutaways that you can go to so that an editor would be able to perhaps stitch two takes together at some point. Um, which could be nice depending on if the director would want that. Um, if you're really tight on time, but yeah, that's kind of cool. So that was shot with. Um, so overall, I guess the DP's main collaborators in prep and on set, theoretically, you would talk to all of these people in prep, um, along with the colorist. So I would say. Possibly the DP has maybe like two circles of collaborators um, that don't really intertwine like a ton. It's kind of the director and the production designer and the producers involved, uh, budgeting, et cetera. And then it's kind of the gaffer, key grip, and the first days. Um, and maybe the gaffer, the key grip would talk with the production designer about what they might need. Um, but aside from that, it's kind of like two concentric circles right next to each other. Um, so I really found that, you know, having department head meetings with the gaffer people first AC is really helpful um, just to get people on the same page. And it's nice. I think we're going to talk about it later, too, for them to have seen the lookbook um, and kind of understand visually what we're trying to go for. And then also overheads and things like that. Um, yeah. And then the, obviously the third person that the you would collaborate the most with is probably the first AD, someone who's probably right by you the entire time on set. Um, and usually you're the two that are, you know, making some of the big decisions schedule wise, dependent on light, cast availability, <laughs> and things of that nature. Um, so yeah, are there any? Yeah, go ahead. I, Dana. I just want to say your your relationship with the first AD is, you know, starting way before the shoot, right? So 
what you're what you guys are doing is you're making a battle plan and be careful because sometimes first ADs have these unrealistic expectations where they're not really thinking through the day. And one thing as a DP that I do is I really imagine and think through the day, right? Um, you know, the, the AD will be like, they'll put out the call sheet and they'll say call time is at 7.30 a.m. First shot's at 7.45 a.m. Well, <laughs> I know film crews. I know that's not going to happen. Okay, so that puts us behind on the first shot. Well, that's not going to happen. So really thinking through, okay, if our call time 7.30, we have to load in, that's going to take this amount of time, then we have to rehearse, then we have to light it, then, you know what I mean? And so really coming up with a realistic plan that you can actually do, there's always going to be stuff that goes wrong. You know, somebody hits a fire alarm or, um, you know, whatever, there's always the chaos. But if you don't make a realistic plan, you're really screwed. So you've got to work with your first AD on a, on a realistic plan. And it also helps you know um, how much time you have to get stuff done. So say you have a scene in a bar and the bar allows the crew to be in there uh, at 10 p.m., for, to 3 p.m., 3 a.m. So say you have it from 10 p.m. to 3 a.m., and it's what we call a hard out. At 3 a.m., you have to be done. So now you know you you have your – where you want to – what your time limit is. So you need to go back and really think through, okay, we have 10 shots to do in the bar. What's the most efficient way of doing it? And let's come up with a plan so at 3 a.m. we're walking away and everybody's happy. Most definitely. Yeah, and we can get more into like scheduling with the first AD in a bit um, with strip boards, etc. Um, but I would say probably one of the biggest collaborators because at the end of the day, if the DP most of the time doesn't, you know, it's kind of seen as the DP's responsibility to quote unquote make the day, get everything shot. Um, if that doesn't happen, that's really obviously not good. <laughs> so. Well, it's not fair though if they don't give you a realistic mm -hmm. plan, you know, I mean, if they give you a day that's not accomplishable, that's, you know, yeah. I mean, it's your fault for allowing it, but <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we could talk more about that soon as well. Um, yeah. Some of the ways I like to personally communicate with department heads are with um, just obviously lookbook images. So something on the left is a lookbook image that was used um, and something on the right is like the final product of something that was like Kind of inspired by um, the lookbook image in some sense, in some ways. So, one of the things that we did was something the director and I really liked, and the production designer as well, was these curtains right here. So those were brought in for the window and things like that. Um, so this is something that I feel like is just way better than words in general. I feel like you could show this image to someone and they would completely understand what you're going for. Um, so. You, that kind of communication, I feel like, is just invaluable with your department heads because everyone is on the same plan. Um, and then going forward, this is actually the overhead of the shot um, that was used from the previous lookbook image. So usually, personally, when I go out in a location scout, I bring a measure and a notebook and my phone or a camera um, and take probably like a million photos of an entire space and videos so that things are laid out. And then personally, what I do is I just go into Photoshop and draw out the outline of the image and then um, go from there. But I found that it's like extremely helpful in showing pops, possibly a lookbook image and then coupled with that overhead because there's no way someone could be confused after seeing that. They know what direction you're looking in, what needs to be ready at the start of the day, the room or brought in. Um, and I found that also it's helpful in working with the production designer um, to create spaces, especially now in, a, in the COVID era of filmmaking. You're not going to be able to go into these spaces very often. You might as well start making overheads um, and saying, you know, oh, the blocking's like, you know, on the right side of this couch over here. We should maybe add it right here and maybe do something over here as well. So I've found personally that that is extremely helpful in prep and especially now in that a lot of location availability will not be very easy to access. Um, yeah, if anyone is curious about um, like 
how I make overheads or whatever, I can definitely share that as well, but it's pretty in depth in Photoshop. I don't even know if that's the best way. I just started doing it. Um, and I usually go into the John C. Richardson Library in the Lincoln Park. Um, and they have those tablets there that you can actually draw on. Um, and that's what I've found to be pretty easy for myself. Um, yeah, Dana, do you have any input on overheads and kind of how it's helped you in the past as well? Yeah, just that. I mean, you know, again, just figuring out what camera positions are going to be where. You, you know, you can always change a plan, but as long as you have a plan, and I think you'll find that you're just doing work that you're happier with when you do stuff like this. Mm -hmm. Most definitely. Um, I found too, especially like communicating with the gaffer and cube grip, it's pretty great because they know exactly what the rough frame is, even before camera is set or whatever. Um, because one of my biggest gripes is like, you know, you wanting people to start lighting, you wanting people to start going, and they're like, oh, let's just see the frame first. Like, no, you can get everything ready before that, and then we can find um, So I feel like having an overhead is really helpful. For this kind of stuff, I usually don't add in like light sources or anything. I kind of leave that to the gaffer, but that's my personal preference. Um, so I just kind of added in where I'd like the source coming from and the directionality. Um, and then also like the stop that I'd like to be at. Um, so the gaffer would know kind of what we'd need for that specific situation. That's overheads. Um, and then moving on and communicating with department heads is kind of collaborating with the first AD. Um, so the first AD I feel like is your buddy on set just because they are really next to you the entire time. And you're like, as you said, Dana, making a battle plan. Um, and so, it's really important to have their trust in you, I've found, because I've worked with some people who don't really, they want to do things in the most efficient way, but at the same time, sometimes the most efficient way is shooting, you know, the day exterior at noon in the middle of an open field, which is not great, you know, as far as light wise. So you definitely have to work with them in some senses, because I feel like a lot of people, you know, ideally, you know, they'd like to go up at 8 a.m. or go home at 8 p.m. or whatever, but let's say you want to shoot a sunrise thing, well, you're showing up at 5 a.m., you know, because the sun's going to rise at 6. By the time everyone gets ready and gets coffee, it's going to be like 5.50. <laughs> so that's something that I really try to work with the first AD with. Um, so usually the first AD will put out a one-liner or something of that nature from Movie Magic, um, which is a software you can use, I believe, on all computers at um, and they also do have a student discount that you can contact the production office for. Um, yeah, essentially it kind of runs through the scenes that you're doing that day, what time of day it is, cast that's going to be there. Um, so the cast numbers are essentially the cast is numbered from who's in the movie the most versus who's in it the least, et cetera. Um, a general timeline is something I've seen some ADs do of like, you know, we need to get this done by seven, et cetera. But Obviously, sometimes things don't go to plan, so compromises need to be made in some senses. Um, and then something I personally like to do, I don't really know if this is something a lot of people do for narrative stuff, but I make what's called like a, a time of day sheet, which is after having gone to the location and visiting it, I like to kind of really plan out based on the shot list and the overheads, what essentially scenes we need to be at a certain time. Um, but that can be seen down here, which is essentially, I think, pretty helpful because, you know, scene one, you'd obviously, it's a blue hour scene. It'd be ideal to shoot it at blue hour um, and things of that nature. But, you know, at the same time, schedule wise, you can maybe take sunset for sunrise and sunrise for sunset um, in the morning for the evening and things of that nature. So that's usually what I try to do. And it's kind of a little tough because you always want to compromise. You don't want to compromise in some senses, but with the schedule, there's always going to be something that comes up where, unfortunately, it just doesn't work out. Um, so I really try to work in to the sun path um, on the shooting day, especially if it's daytime, anything. Because um, I've even had instances, you know, where we're shooting on the second floor of like a building, and the bathroom has a really nice light coming in at like 5:30, you know. 
it's too high to even put something up there to emulate that. So you just have to be able to shoot it at 530, ideally, um, and things of that nature. So I actually do take sun map readings um, throughout the day, and which kind of gives you a projection of where the sun will be throughout the day. And then I also do it for inside sun as well. Um, and I even do it for nighttime work too, because it can be pretty accurate in telling you the sunrise and sunset. Um, yeah, that's kind of the time of day sheet. I also like to put some notes down here. Um, if anyone wants like a template of it, really it's just this, but I can definitely send that your way as well. Um, I do want to yeah. say in case anybody's getting worried, you know, this is next level stuff, right? So uh, this is because Nia Hall has gone out and shot stuff and then didn't like it or was happy with it or whatever it is. So this is his way of taking the lessons he's learned and then you know, figuring out stuff that's working for him. So don't feel like, mm -hmm. you know, when you guys go out to shoot the first few times, you know, you will make mistakes or be not be happy with stuff. And that's okay. Cause we can't, we can't just all be great at the first time we do stuff. So don't get intimidated by any of this. Definitely. Yeah. I, the only reason I really like to do this is because it helps me give proper answers to the first AD. Sometimes if they want to, you know, move, let's say scene four up, but let's say scene four is an evening scene and like, do that. Um, no, it's super awesome. Yeah. Super yeah. helpful. Yeah. So that's kind of that stuff. And if you guys have any questions, definitely let us know. Um, and then kind of moving on to talking with the post department. Um, ideally, obviously, as Dana has said before, an editor will be brought on to facilitate any questions that may arise about quote unquote, the workflow. Um, so all the workflow is, is essentially how footage will be transferred throughout ages of reproduction or production through post-production. Um, and one of the things I've found that has hurt me in the past is not really deciding exactly or committing to what codec or resolution you'll be shooting. So the production can get, you know, things like hard drives before, um, it's not a great feeling when you show up the first day and hard drives are not on set. <laughs> um, so, you know, I've used things like these footage calculators that I've linked below. There's also quite a few. Um, a really dirty way to do it would just be figure out the size of your card, put in the codec you want in your camera, see how much time is left, and then go from there. Um, I have, you know, it depends on obviously the codec you're shooting and things like that, but I know a lot of people, to, at least in my realm, have talked about around like, an eight to one or 10 to one shooting ratio, but even that's like pretty um, efficient for a lot of students stuff. So I would say, you know, the worst thing you could do is get a bigger hard drive and then use it on your next project. Because um, the worst thing would be to run out of space. And also make sure to have three backups. Um, another it thing that I oh. oh, sorry, go ahead, Dan. Well, it doesn't necessarily mean shooting the highest codec that the camera is capable of. Because you could really be filling up cards and filling up hard drives for no good reason. And that's something in documentary we do. Because my rule of thumb in documentary is on a full day of documentary shooting, I end up with about five hours of footage, which is a lot. So I can't, I mean, I'm not shooting in like crazy, you know, gigabyte a second uh, codecs because we just don't have the hard drive space for them. And I don't want those cards to keep filling up. Mm -hmm. I think Dana, you also touched on this earlier. It's something where you start at the end of your product, right? We're trying to create maybe a short film or a feature film or something like that. And you're kind of trying to think, you know, where is it going to be displayed or seen? Um, so, you know, let's say Quibi kind of went down, but let's say it goes on something like that nature. You probably don't need to be shooting in raw or Ari raw at like 8K. Um, so, you know, kind of designing things in terms of what is actually necessary for the format that the audience will be doing with them. Um, yeah, I think there's a DP named Steve Yedlin who's done a lot of tests on resolution, color space, and things like that. And I would definitely recommend you guys check that out if you're at all interested in it. Because he does some comparisons of resolution and stuff in an online format. And it's interesting that most people can't tell the difference whatsoever. I definitely couldn't. Um, Here, here's story time. 
is uh, I had a student who went out and shot something for somebody and they they insisted on shooting the red at full Kodak, like no compression. And these files were huge and they kept filling up all these hard drives. And uh, he got, went to the screening you know, the guy called him and said, hey, the film's done, come see it. And he's like, oh my God, I can't wait to see my hard work. And he goes to the screening and they had to show it on a like a tiny little screen. Uh, they couldn't blow it up because what had happened is that they his computer, the director's computer couldn't edit these huge uh, red raw files. So they transcoded it to some really crappy codec and then edited it and didn't know enough to link back to the original files. They just... <laughs> they edited it in like some really awful codec and then that's what they showed it in and the dp was like all that work for nothing we could have shot it on an iphone yeah it's interesting you gotta know your finishing format that's pretty key <laughs> yeah that's awesome so i guess one of the things that i do to communicate with the editor is just make a very simple like layout of what we're shooting on, frame rate, et cetera, um, and the codec, um, just so that the editor is on board and kind of knows what's going on. And then in terms of the finishing stuff, depending on the aspect ratio, I would just alter the resolution that you shot in to the one that would match the aspect ratio that you would like to finish. Um, and I know that stuff is pretty confusing at a lot of points. So if anyone has any questions on that specifically, definitely let us know. So these two we have a question. Oh, no, it's okay. Um, basically, how do you decide like everything that you have under shooting and finishing in that little screenshot from love? How do you decide all of those things? How do you decide what camera you're shooting on? All of the things? Mm -hmm. Totally. So I guess um, this is kind of an interesting topic, because it's like, a lot of students, I think, are really eager to use, you know, the RE cameras or the RED cameras. But at the end of the day, you know, depending on the project, obviously, like, if it's just going to be you on set, you probably don't want to be using the Alexa XD. You know, it's just not going to be a great situation. It'll probably look great, but you'll probably, you know, like stretch your back out or something. It won't be great. So in terms of a practical sense, I like to think about crew footprint that'll be on set or if it's a documentary like you know what kind of stuff they'll be doing if it's sit down stuff where it's kind of verite and moving around quite a bit that would inform camera choice based on weight um, my experiences with the camera like in tests and things like that if, and if it's intuitive to use um, and things of that nature so at least for the project love that i did um we only had first AC, who's Miles Anderson. Um, so it was just me and Miles. So essentially we went with a pretty pared down package just because we knew that the two of us couldn't handle something that was bigger. Um, so we went with the C300 Mark II. Um, and then in terms of frame rate, it's 2398. Um, 2976 was actually what it was, but I think on the Canon cameras, that's what it's listed as. Um, I think the bigger decision for a lot of people after picking the camera is Kodak. Um, and personally for me, because of where the film was going to be showing, et cetera, I knew that we didn't really need a lot of resolution because it would probably be most likely showing in a compressed format most of the time. Um, so what I instead opted for was kind of a higher um, Kodak for color. So it's RGB 444. So it essentially tw it was 12 bit. Essentially what that means is you just have more information. Um, so in color correction, you can kind of make some more tweaks on things that you might not be happy with. So that's kind of what I chose. Um, yeah, Dana, it'd be interesting to hear kind of what you, what goes into your decisions in terms of equipment and things of that nature. Yeah, I mean, when you're talking about all this 12-bit RGB resolution thing, I mean, I've heard DP say, I don't want more pixels, I want better pixels. Mm. And that's basically what you chose. And I would also make an analogy here where if you know anything about mountain climbing, there's two ways to climb a mountain. One way is to throw a backpack on and you're alone and you head up to the top of that mountain and make it to the peak and you make it right back down because you're traveling light and fast. And then the other way is the way that you may have seen where you have your um, Sherpas and you, you bring, you start a base camp and then you go to 
base camp two and the Sherpas bring everything to base camp two and then you go to base camp three and they bring everything to base camp three and you make it's a longer process. You're bringing more stuff, more support. And that's, you know, a bigger crew is that, right? Where you're going to go from base camp to base camp. So be thinking about that, like how, what, and each project is different. Some projects, it might be more appropriate to do the big crew and base camp to base camp and other ones it might be more appropriate to go light and fast. So knowing uh, a variety of cameras and knowing which one, which package is which is uh, important. Definitely. Yeah. And I think a lot of people are really, I remember my freshman year, you know, working on some bigger sets of the fall and kind of really wanting to have that. Um, but then you kind of realize like, you know, you're all there to make something. So everything should be kind of more centered on the product, not really the workflow necessarily or crew or things of that nature. So I feel like sometimes people can get really caught up into that up into like the materialistic aspects of things like what camera you're shooting on how big your crew is um at the end of the day you know you want to make a good product yeah don't do things because you think you should you know that you think that's the way it that you would would do it or whatever and i know that there's some very famous dps you know roger deakins or janusz kaminski i know they do things the way they think they should be done they don't care about what other people have done or they don't care about the way that other people do them they're like listen you know i see it this way this is the way i want to do it and then they they follow through on that right for right or wrong you know and that's how they've learned mm -hmm. and i guess one of the things that i was pretty intimidated by when i was shooting at first short was that in terms of crew size i just wasn't really sure of what kind of crew size was needed to accomplish what the director wanted you know so I heard a saying a while back um, that you know, the best people have better people around them. And that's kind of the approach that I would take. You know, if it's your first time doing something, I would definitely bring in maybe a mentor or someone that you trust that's done it before, or someone that's really eager even to, you know, help you problem solve this. Because sadly, it's like, at least that I found, it was just experience that I needed to be able to understand maybe what kind of crew size was necessary for one project versus the other, just based on trial and error. So I would definitely, you know, ask other people and hire better people than you. Yeah, and I tell people like, this is not your last project you're gonna shoot. Like don't die on this hill, right? Mm -hmm. That you just, you know, you do your best in each project and then you take that knowledge and you move to the next one. And to be honest, a lot of people aren't ready for their great project yet, right? You're not ready for that killer script or that amazing film. You need to kind of work on some stuff that, you know, it's okay, it's okay, it's good. You're making it as good as you can. And then you're getting a toolkit, tools in your toolkit. You learn this, you learn this, you learn this, you learn this. By the time you turn around and you shot a bunch of stuff and then you get that great script, that great opportunity, now you're ready, right? But you don't get ready until you, you work on some stuff before that. Totally. That's really awesome. Cool. And then in terms of, obviously we're talking about pre-production and things like that. You also want to, one of the things that's not listed on here is bringing a colorist on board and kind of, at least at the very minimum, you know, getting them to understand the story, send them the script, always send all your department has the script um, because things always stem from there and then sending them you know reference images and things like that from your lookbook so moving on this is kind of the stuff that you would want to share with your department heads i feel like the time of day sheet that i did is also nice to share with department heads but the main two that i've found are super helpful are the shot list and obviously overheads and perhaps you know things of like location photos are going to be increasingly important just because you guys are not going to be able to scout things with the entire crew or all, even all the department heads in today's world. So I would definitely say these are the kind of kinds of things you want to look out for and share with them to get them on the same page. Um, so yeah, location scouting. I feel like now location scouting is going to be a lot less people moving forward and possibly even virtually. Um, but in the time being, you know, talk about like scouting something in person. Um, it's ideal for obviously all of the key crew members to see the location and scout it before 
shooting in there just because you don't, as Dan has said, want, want to walk into a situation and see that, you know, oh, we're shooting on the 17th floor of this building. <laughs> looks great in the photos on the 17th floor, but we're on the first floor right now. So things of that nature and surprises, you know, because at the end of the day, at least I've found that maybe producers are really, even the most talented producers, they aren't able to look out for all of the so it's really important for, you know, a specific department to go into location and make sure it works for them. Um, so ideally, I feel like some of the first things I look at in location, I know Dana, you mentioned availability issues at a bar. Ideally, you would not shoot at that bar and shoot at a bar that would let you be there longer if you needed to get more done. Um, but if that's the only option due to budget, et cetera, it's kind of, you need to figure out Work. So a location scout can help you facilitate that and understand, you know, where specific things will go. And a lot of it is logistical in some senses, but I think it's also really creative because you're in a possible location and this is where everything's going to happen. So one of the things I would also recommend is um, scouting at the time of day you'll be shooting. I cannot stress this enough. Um, it's not great. You know, sometimes I've scouted like, let's say, nighttime exterior in an alley. Um, and this really did happen. We scouted and we saw that there was a street light up above and we were like, this is great. Like we're going to use this and base our whole lighting setup off of this. And then we showed up and it turns out that street light was dead. So it was not great in that sense because we planned around something that really wasn't there. And if we had just maybe gone five hours later, scouted at night, which would have been a pain in some sense, because it would have been a lot better and possibly made the product better. Um, yeah, Dana, is there anything that you feel like is really important during location scouting specifically? I can't really think of anything you didn't cover. Mm -hmm. It's awesome. Yeah. Awesome. So Nahal, a question from your favorite producer over here. Um, what so the way that we're basically taught to do location scouts is like you do a location scout with the DP and the director, usually the first AD to decide if you're going to lose that location, if you're going to use that location. And then you do a tech scout with like the DP, the gaffer, the key grip. Would you say that is smart? Or do you think just like the first time you go in, everyone should be there, all opinions should be heard? I've always wondered that. Um... I wonder if it's the way that we're taught that so that production doesn't have to pay all the department heads to do a scout. <laughs> but I would say it's kind of important to do a main key scout, which would be the director, producer, maybe the production designer, um, and then bring camera and lighting in later for tech scout and sound as well. Um, just so that, you know, things are more mainstream and together because you could be looking at, you know, five locations that day. And when you bring in your key crew members, Ideally for me, um, I would like for it to be the locked location just so that everyone can kind of get into the creative space because it's sometimes a little saddening when you go into a space with like all your key department heads and everyone really loves it. And then let's say it doesn't work out for one reason or the other. It kind of feels like a little bit of creative momentum is lost sometimes. Um, that's just what I would say. I would say that's kind of the way to Cool. Yeah, Thank Dana, you. do you have anything else to add to that? Or do you feel like that's a pretty solid way to approach location scouting? Well, I guess I would just put in my little pitch about location. So if you put in all this work and you've you've scouted this location, I would say just be really be sure as a DP to shoot that location so that we can see it. And I feel like this is kind of a beginner mistake where people um, say you're shooting in a diner and they just end up doing like a two shot over over on the people at the table and they never take full advantage of the fact that they got this whole diner and they don't shoot an exterior they don't shoot they don't step back and you know see the other tables and put in the sense of the space and follow a waitress over and see the cook cooking and all those interesting things that really bring us to that location so i guess i would just say when you make that effort to 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 actually scout a real location, really visually um, milk it. Awesome. Use it. Just let us see it. Totally. Yeah, this is kind of another 
and things to look for on a scout. One of the main things I do with the daytime thing is using like a sun positioning app. Um, there's a couple which I'll list later on that are available on iOS and Android that are really helpful. Some of them are paid and some of them are free. Um, yeah, sun position is pretty important. Obviously, there's also some logistics, load in, where can the crew be here? Location, just a small, very small studio apartment. Maybe you shouldn't have a lot of gear. Um, and this kind of works back to the kind of size you might need because let's say you're shooting in a small location. Shooting in small you don't spaces. want like 30 people, obviously, especially now in a small space. Um, Location constraints, things of that nature, especially in terms of timing, et cetera, is really important. Um, and kind of also, I think, on student stuff, like seeing how the owner reacts to certain things. I know like a production designer that I've worked with a lot came in sheets. One of the first things she asks um, on a location scout to the owner is if they can move specific things. And based on that, you know, they can say yes, but then, you know, once you're shooting there, oh, you know, you can't move the entire left of this wall or whatever that's on the wall. Um, so that's sometimes obviously pretty unideal because you plan for a certain thing and that plan has been botched. So definitely making sure that the location owner is okay with what you guys are doing and obviously also in the know. So, you know, even share with books or overheads or whatever. The more information I think that they usually have, the more open they are to letting you use their space. And another last thing I feel like I usually look for, even on a first scout without the gaffer and key group, et cetera, is just power. Um, you know, it would be the worst thing if you're on the 17th floor and you didn't have power because of that huge nightmare. So things of that nature, you know, if that's something that's not available, it's probably not the best location, or, you know, you might need to bring something in like a generator, et cetera. Um, so yeah, that's one of the things I also ask always for is for the fuse box, the location manager, show that just so that you know you know where that is in case something goes wrong um, yeah that's kind of the basics that i usually look for on a scout um, so this is something that i pulled um, from the dsc's instagram and it's a really really fantastic revisualization of a short um, this is a short called key chain shot by nick manuel and it's i couldn't think of a better way to show this because this is really how a scout should be done so there's apps called um, their director's viewfinder apps. Um, I think the cheaper one on iOS and Android is called Cadridge. And the more expensive one, which is also the same, I believe, is Artemis viewfinder. Um, and those are really nice because they're really smart apps and that you can really put in the camera that you're using, the lenses, et cetera. And they'll give you a really accurate representation of the focal length of a lens. Um, so obviously for this short, Nick was using Cadridge um, and he was pre-visualizing something on this couch right here. And then he used the Sunseeker app to figure out, you know, the best time of day to shoot this is in between, you know, around three to four. So this is kind of one of the best situations in which everything works out. You know, the sun is out, it's all working out. Everyone's on the same page and the direction that you're looking in, et cetera. So, the more closer you can get to like seeing something that's close to an image on the location scout, I think the better you'll be prepared in the future um, for shooting. Yeah, go ahead, Dana. I think doing this on your phone is, is an option, but I would argue that using a DSLR with a zoom lens that, you know, you're able to do multiple focal lengths, I think is gonna be, I'm gonna say more helpful mm -hmm. because all the ones on the phone just they just crop the image but actually lenses different lenses see in a different way so i mean a, a you know a 135 you noticed in that it's just a close up of that plate yeah technically it is but actually if you put a real 135 millimeter lens on a camera that background's going to be much more out of focus you're going to you might have something in the foreground like it's a whole you know, you may not be able to even get it because there's a wall there, whatever it is. So um, I personally think a DSLR with a zoom lens or your prime lenses could even be a little, even a little more helpful. And you can do video on DSLR, you know, walk through the move, that kind of thing. So I would argue for that. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and I would say also like the, vis the video storyboard that you kind of mentioned, Dana, is a really good use of time, especially if you have talent or someone able to sit in or stand in. Um, one of the experiences that I have had with these kind of apps too, I should note that they kind of, especially for me when I started using them, discouraged me because honestly, any shot that you have on it looks really bad. <laughs> Just anything you put up looks terrible because there's no depth of field and the image is very, very cropped in. So it kind of did discourage me in a lot of senses. So something like a DSLR would be a better prediction moving forward of what you guys will have as an image. Um, I should note too, this is, if you guys would want this, the vault does have actual director's viewfinders, um, which is basically just the lens mount you put to your eye and you put the actual lens on it. And you can kind of pre-visualize where things would be, which are very helpful. Um, so I'd also utilize that if you can. I mean, the drawback yeah. is you can't capture it. So if you do it on a DSLR, you can take a still or a video of it. And that way you have it for reference. The, the director's finders we have, they're great, I think, on set to really kind of walk through like a dolly move or other things. They're wonderful, but in a pre-production sense, they're a little trouble because you can't really document mm -hmm. so much. Yeah, especially with in terms of the logistics of getting the lenses to the set, et cetera, it might be a little bit of a pain for a location scout. Yeah, moving on. So this is kind of just equipment and checking out some information that students should know. Um, equipment can be reserved up to 30 days in advance for undergraduate projects and 60 days in advance for thesis films by graduate students. Um, and if you pull up this, there's a link to the future portal, which is where you make the reservations. Um, I should note it's basically 30 days to the exact time that you want to check out. So let's say you want to prep at, you know, 11 a.m. the day before shooting you would only be able to reserve that 30 days before at 11 a.m. So definitely keep that in mind. Um, yeah, equipment checkout from the Vulture Center space also usually requires a prep day, which is just also a really nice day in terms of going over the equipment and making sure everything's functioning. And it's basically just covering yourself so that everything is set so you can be the most efficient while you're on the shoot. Um, and obviously things like this, like equipment and stuff we've talked about, practicality and things like that. So hopefully that's figured out around that. Um, yeah, Dana, do you have anything else to add in terms of equipment and checking out things like that? No, uh, just, you know, keep it simple. You know, mm -hmm. don't, especially at the beginning, don't load yourself up with a ton, a ton of gear and get overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. Most definitely. Which is also consequently just more money in terms of Um, yeah, and if you guys have, you know, one of the things that I always like to think about during prep is, are there any last piece, like last minute pieces of equipment that you might need to overcome a specific issue or problem? Uh, and, or an example of this would be, oh, wow, it's raining all weekend, we're shooting outside, you know, you might need a rain cover, you yes. might need a to put over your lights, maybe a pop-up tent or two for production, um, and some logistical things of that nature. And as always, you know, if you guys have any questions in terms of equipment or what might be available or best for your project or to overcome a specific issue, this contact information is here. Um, Joe Lyons and Eric Lagraki work at Cinespace, and obviously Dana and Pete are cinematography professors, here, so they can definitely answer any questions you guys might have. Um, yeah, this is kind of, I feel like, going through what an effective prep looks like that everyone on the crew overall is informed about the game plan and on set so that things can move quickly and efficiently. So your battle plan is completely successful and you can actually make, you know, a cool piece of work. So hopefully, you know, this was helpful. Um, I don't know if you guys have any other questions or anything like that that we could cover. Yeah. I just want to say I used to be a first camera assistant on in the union and uh, I just have, it's another story time. So uh, <laughs> I used to work on shoots and everything was great. And I was really good at my job. And I was like, hey, I'm pretty good at this. And then I get on other shoots or shows and I would be terrible. I'd be like putting up the wrong lens or I couldn't get the camera set up in time. And I'd be, I'd be really struggling. And I think that's so weird. Like, why was I so good on that shoot and so terrible on this shoot? What's going on? And then I finally figured out it's because the, 
the people that were running the, the kind of the brain of the operation, the, it's like a body. The crew, the film crew is like a body. If the brain is confused about what it's doing, the body doesn't know what that what's next what to anticipate what to set up what to, i mean, set this up and it's wrong it's so if the if the brain is clear the people running it is clear then the body moves more efficiently the crew moves more efficiently they know what to expect they have stuff ready they can anticipate what you're thinking mm -hmm. yeah most definitely i feel like there's also like being on set in a sense of unknown is really hard for a lot of crew members just because you don't even know what's happening next. There are things can't even get ready beforehand. So hopefully things like a shot list and, you know, things like an overhead might not be the greatest thing and the most fun to do, but it's going to make your life probably a thousand times easier on set. So you don't have to tell like 50 different people what's happening at all times. Right. Yeah. I mean, this stuff is hard enough. Why are we making it harder? <laughs> Definitely. Leah, are there any questions that people might have? So I have one final one. Um, so the quarter of prep overall has been, you know, for specifically first years to kind of figure out how to make a pre-production package um, when all of the equipment centers and everything opens back up again. And so we're going to have a lot of, you know, writer, director, producers. Um, so kind of what as a DP is something that seems to go unnoticed um, for that producer production person. Mm. Well, I just want to say, I don't know if this answers your question, but I do want to say this, that get your uh, equipment wish list, your res reservation list in really early so it gets approved and you get all the stuff you want. Um, I didn't say this, but... <laughs> You know, you can reserve stuff and then cancel it. You know, you can over order a little bit. Um, so, you know, make sure that you're covered. A lot of people don't want to make the reservation until they absolutely know exactly what they want. And then they go to reserve and it's all taken. Mm -hmm. Most definitely. I would say that's always a great idea because at the end of the day, there's no sweat off anyone's back because it's just online now. So you could just go ahead and cancel it and not have to interact with anyone in doing so to receive any fallout. Um, and additionally, I guess, Leah, one of the things that might, I think sometimes go, like a lot of people are really ambitious in terms of what they can get done in a specific day. Um, I love really being under ambitious so that you can get <laughs> great stuff on set. So I would say, you know, add another shooting day on to what you're doing or, you know, budget a lot more time, maybe three times up to what you think you might need for a specific day. So I can assure you it'll, it will even be longer than that. Um, yeah, I would say definitely give a lot more time for your projects overall. And, uh, you know, as a beginning shooter also just, you know, your first, when you start a scene, right, it's going to be six shots or whatever. I think a beginner mistake is your first shot. You overlight it, you over overthink it, and you burn up a lot of time on that first shot. And it looks amazing. And then <laughs> you start to run out of time. And by shot six, you're like, oh, screw the light, just roll. <laughs> and so <laughs> just be careful of that. Definitely. It's a slippery slope. <laughs> is there anything else, Leah? No, we don't have any more questions. If there's anything else you guys would like to add, I think this is great. I mean, for my producer brain, this makes a lot more sense to me. At least. <laughs> so if nothing else, you helped me. Awesome. That's what we're here for. <laughs> <laughs> no, but thank yeah. you so much, you guys, for doing this. It was it was really great and really informative. Okay, great. Right. Yeah, this has been great, guys. All right, keep shooting. <laughs> <laughs>